Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? Uh, in the sessions that we have just completed, we did a mini series about some of the modern trends in Islam. We started actually with some kalam type topics. We sp spoke about Al Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, and these kinds of things. And then we moved to some of the modern trends. Now we're going to be talking about some of the shubuhat. Now, this is the final thing we're going to be doing right before we start the intellectual sirah on the uh, on January, inshallah. So this is going to be about six lessons all together. And we're going to cover some things which we've already covered before. But because of the importance of these topics and the, uh, the repetitive nature of us either hearing these topics or dealing with them, we're going to be covering some of them again. And some other shubuhat topics in some greater detail that we haven't before. The first thing we're going to be looking at today is jihad, uh, which of course is something I think we've covered before, but this time we have to cover it uh, with a bit more participation because I've spoken a lot, you know, in the in, in the past. So the first question I want to ask is, what is jihad, and what are the different types of jihad? Is it to um, to strive and struggle? Great. So there's a linguistic definition. And then there is a you call a terminological definition, okay? And this subdivision of linguistic and terminological definition is something we need to get used to. They say lughatan wastalahan, the terminology and linguistics. So what you've mentioned is correct. It is the linguistic definition. And uh, this linguistic definition is in the Quran. For example, in the end of Surah Al-Ankabut, the, uh, the end part of the 29th chapter. Uh, right? And the ones who have strived in our way. So this takes more of the uh, linguistic, you know, because jahadu fina. So they have strived in our way. This is the kind of translation you're going to find for this particular. A verse in the Quran. So certainly it's not a wrong thing to say because many people think this is us being apologetic by saying that jihad means to strive and to struggle. It's not actually, it's, it's the linguistic term. You know, it is uh, what it means and there is different types of jihad and one of the jihads is in fact jihad on nafs. So what is jihad on nafs, uh, Furqan? Um, jihad the one, so basically I would describe me trying to improve, become a better Muslim by I don't know, praying on time. So something that uh, you fight with, with your own nafs to become. Yeah, so the nafs, absolutely, this is a good answer. The nafs is the self or the soul or the self, whatever, how you want to translate it. And a jihad on nafs is basically you kind of fighting against yourself, for lack of a better term but doing so in, in the spirit of self, spiritual self-improvement. And what are the ways you can do jihad al-nafs, uh, Farqan? Mm. So, by becoming maybe more spiritual. How so? Uh, praying, for instance. Okay, brilliant. Uh, that, that's... Uh, an excellent way of putting it. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمِ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ وَالْحِلْمِ بِالتَّحَلُّمْ And I think there's a hadith that says, وَالصَّبْرُ بِالتَّصَبْرُ Which basically, and, and I was looking into this hadith, very beautiful and interesting hadith. إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمِ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ That learning, you know, it comes from you exerting yourself to extract knowledge. Yeah? Or uh, acquiring knowledge is from, from doing, from the process of actually extracting the knowledge. Al-hilm is forbearance. That's how they translate hilm, right? But it includes, it includes having self-control in situations where it's difficult to do so. It also includes being kind and so on for your, you know, people that you, uh, that you might not find it easy to do so. So this is hilm, bittahallum. So you need to be a practitioner of hilm. In other words, the best way to improve yourself is by doing the activity. Sabr but tasabr, that to be patient, you have to put yourself in a situation where you are 
afflicted by something and then you overcome it. But, you know, and this is a, a beautiful thing. I'll tell you something I was looking at, actually. In psychology, and many of you have heard the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And actually, I was reading a book some time ago by some guy called Van der Kolk. And the book was called The Body Keeps Score. And he was an individual who actually pioneered the diagnosis of PTSD. And it was people that came after war, I think it was the Vietnam War, the Second World War, where they came to a center and he was explaining in the book like how, you know, he, he put together these kinds of general uh, diagnoses which then he could identify people who had PTSD. And PTSD is where a trauma in your life has caused you to kind of revisit that trauma. And he gives very interesting uh, kind of, um, you know, examples. He was saying like when he gives participants the chance to recall an event. If it's a, an event which is traumatic, they are more likely to remember and recall all the particulars of that event. Whereas if it's an event which is not so, then the memory of it is less vivid. And so these are some of the things of PTSD, obviously nightmares, scares, panic attack, all that stuff. It's become a formal diagnosis. But there's another thing which is very interesting, which is less spoken about, which is called PTG which is referred to as post-traumatic growth, which in many ways, to crudely put it, is the opposite of PTSD. is where calamity of, uh, in life or in, in situ you know, has put you in a position which is improved. You look in the world in a different way now because of the calamity. And I was speaking with my uncle when I went to Egypt, in Alexandria. I think I told some of you guys this, and he, he had this very... My, my maternal uncle, he had a very traumatic experience where he was living in, a, in an apartment flat and his wife was there, the kids were there, he had the kids. And then the, the building fell and they all died. His wife and kids died. And then he had another child, uh, obviously he's my cousin, this is a long time ago now. They had another child living in another country and she died from natural causes. And then some time after that, his mom died. You know, so I was speaking to him and the way he s speaks, it is absolutely uh, renewed. He goes, I don't look at the world in a different way. I completely look at the world in a different way now. Because uh, these cars moving here completely. He got, I said, how so? He said, every second, I consider it to be extra time, bonus time. Like, it's different when you live through a situation like that. But when you come out with this stamara, with this fruit of post-traumatic growth, these are the kinds of things which, uh, which, has a spiritual and psychological lasting impact. There's a beautiful verse in the Quran in Surah Al Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and you guys can correct me, in in There are some people who worship Allah on the edge. Literally on the edge. If something happens to him which is like good, he's happy with it. And if fitna or a tra trauma afflicts him, he falls on his face. He loses the world and the era hereafter. So I'm not saying you can't have post-traumatic stress disorder as a Muslim. I'm saying if it reaches the level of yes, and if it, which is hopelessness, this is Kufr Akbar. Actually. Because... Uh, the Quran says that whoever, who will be the one who has hopelessness of the mercy of God except for the disbelievers. Interestingly, it's not something that is mentioned in the Waqad al-Islam ibn Abdul Wahab. <laughs> that, you know, the term is, I don't know why he put it there, he should have put it there. It's, you know, it's, if you lose hope of the mercy of Allah, then, uh, then you can become a disbeliever actually. It can, it's what Yaqub was saying and he was the figurehead of patience to his son uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. So, uh, uh, or generally about the situation that he was in. The point is I'm making is, the jihad on nafs should not be underestimated. I think we know that, uh, I think the, Ibn Qayyim, I was reading it, he was talking about jihad on nafs quite at length actually. It's not something which we're retreating, when we talk about jihad on nafs or self-jihad or whatever, it's not something which yani, is fake or something which is PC or politically correct or something. It's something we should actually focus on the spiritual side of our religion. So, because when we talk about jihad, and if we sp speak about fighting for this whole uh, session, 
it may give the wrong impression, which is that the only fighting that has to be done is against people, not against ourselves. And there is jihad against the self, and there's a jihad against the devil, shaitan. There's jihad against all of these forces which we believe metaphysical forces, spiritual forces as well. Now that we've put that on the table, what other types of jihad is there? What other taqsimat did the fuqaha put forward, uh, Maath? What other categorizations are there? There's the obvious on the physical one. Hmm. Within the physical one, what, what are the um, categories? A defensive and proactive. Beautiful. Okay, so can you give us some understanding of that? Well, uh, defensive would be uh, defending yourself and your community from outsiders or, uh, or anta antagonists. Uh, and then proactive would be uh, proactively uh, uh, attacking somebody for s uh, a legitimate shari shari reason, shari reason. And give us some examples in history where both of those things happened. Right, uh, the Battle in, of Badr in Islamic history, for example. Sorry, in Islamic history. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah the Battle of Badr would be a, a case for a defensive one. Um, it was the Battle of Muta, right? Uh, which was a uh, the offensive. Uh, uh, it was more of a raid, right? Yeah, I mean, you can make the argument that because you know, if you look at the the reasons why the Muta happened, like the emissary was sent and then he was killed and these kind of things, there was kind of it was responsive, but s certainly like Fath Mecca was expansive and. All those, uh, you know, these things that came after, like uh, Hunayn was, uh, was proactive, right? So, you know, أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ You know, when you were a lot of people, وَدَاقَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ الْأَرْضِ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ You know, and the earth swallowed you because of what is. So, th this was a time when the Muslims were a lot, you know, and this expanding now. And it happened at the time of the Prophet. And the majority of the Prophet's conflicts, though, were defensive or proactive in his time. The majority were defensive. There are, well, that's not to say there were no proactive ones. We're just saying the vast majority were defensive. Yeah. Now, um, let's move on to the next uh, to the next slide. Now, if someone says, "Well, if your religion has to have an expansionist element," uh, so then therefore there is no situation or conceivability of peace being made between Muslims and non-Muslims. How would you respond, Mahdi, to that? Yeah, so like people who are Jews or Christians, maybe even of other religions that could live within the Islamic State. So Okay, so that's within the Islamic State. You're yeah. right. So now you've got the Islamic State inside of it and then you've got Ahl al-Dhimma, the Mu'ahid, the Mustatmin, all these people, like where they have a contract. It doesn't, we're not going to, is it mean forced conversion or do we believe in forced conversion or? No. What's the ayah in Surah Baqarah? La uh, ikraha din Yeah, la yeah. ikraha din So there's no compulsion in religion. So it's not possible to compel other people or force them to join Islam. Okay, now so what about uh, if we're living in the modern age, if we look at the books of fiqh now, they still speak about jihad or talab. Some of them say it has to be done every year. Like the talab has to be done every year. Uh, so in the modern world, how do we navigate this reality? If, if it has to be done every year, then uh, and someone brings it to you and says, look, it says in your book of fiqh here, that has to be done, jihad talab has to be done every year, or every other year, or every whatever. Yeah, so how would you respond to that in the light of the Quran, Sunnah, and the fiqh that you've uh, gone through before? Uh, so there's like certain stipulations to do jihad talab. So you have to meet like certain criteria to be able to do that. And the current Muslim uh, situation doesn't allow that. Excellent. So that's one way of looking at it. But even if we had the fully fledged Islamic governance, which was fully legitimate, is it within its power, Shakir, to uh, uh, on on other grounds? And what kinds of grounds would they be to create some kind of treaty? Yeah. So um, if you have uh, treaties in place or agreements with other states or other polities, then it wouldn't be allowed for you to be treacherous. Uh, that you have to maintain your, your treaties, your covenants with other peoples. And uh, it would actually yeah. be, I mean, you could actually argue that in many situations it could be in the interest of the Muslims to have those uh, treaties or covenants in place. It's something that the Prophet ﷺ did at certain times uh, for strategic reasons. So it's very feasible. Beautiful. And so, Al Aqud means uh, what? How do you translate that? Uh, to be faithful to your uh, contracts or your agreements. Is that a general rule? As for Muslims and non-Muslims yeah, or just for Muslims? Yeah. For Muslims and non-Muslims. Okay, so now I've got a question. And this may be a bit of a... For you, uh, Shakir. 
in the Quran, what is the only exception? That, uh, maybe I, I'm saying the only, but one of the only, I should say. Hmm. Or give me an example of a Quranic exception of where you shouldn't fulfill your contract. This might be a difficult question. Where you shouldn't fulfill your contract. Yeah. Since for October. I'm not going to give you any. Uh, you, you, okay, everyone can get involved, but I'm not going to give you any. Are we considering situations where the other side has already broken the contract first? Okay, what's the ayah? First ayah of Surah Tawbah. Bala'atu min Allahi wa Rasulihi. Okay, that could be. Uh, but there's something more clear I'm thinking about. If they, if they start it. There's something more clear than this about breaking the contracts, about where you where you shouldn't fulfill the contracts. What I'm thinking about is mm. This is a situation where you shouldn't fulfill the contract. Because it says if they if they break their contract in after they have made a contract with you and they have attacked your religion now then fight the leaders of this belief so contracts are two-way situations you know they, it's not just one way it's two ways i mean if, if they break it there's no contract anymore if there's, if yani, you can't make a contract, so they break it and then they say, well, why are you doing X, which we've agreed to? Because you've already broken the contract. There is no contract no more. Is that the same with um, the situation in Medina? When the, uh, the people left um, the battlefield and they had a contract to, um, you know, when, when they were, when they actually left the battlefield, a quarter, a quarter of the army left and they broke the contract there and then. Which one are we talking about? Are we talking um, I think it's the the first. Uh, Badr. Yeah, where, where they literally left the battlefield because the prophet didn't listen to their counsel. One of them, you oh, know, the oh, big one. Uh, Uhud, Uhud. Yes, sorry, yes. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that's a contract issue. I think that's more of a ta issue, like an obedience issue. Okay. Because you know, wa'fu anhum wa'fillahum wa shawirhum fil amr. Allah says He gives uh, the Prophet sallam advice on how to do with them. He says, for, for, you know, pardon them, forgive them, and seek their counsel in the affair. You know, either uh, azam tafatawakal Allah, and when you uh, have made up your mind on the issue, then have reliance on God and so on. Um, so this is how contracts work in Islam, and this is I've mentioned this before. I feel this is a very good point of commonality between liberal theory and Islam, because c consent and contract work in both. Uh, kind of world views consent and contracts are very uh, important to world, world world so, so it's, it makes it possible for there to be business and so on there's three ayahs which uh, I think everyone should know and I've mentioned this I think to you guys before but I, this is important for us to because this comes up all the time what ayahs would you bring to the table if I were to say listen Islam is a religion which cannot get along with other people of other faiths what ayahs would you bring uh, let's say Tariq, what would you say? Um, well, um, I know that if, if we're living in a, we have to obey the, the rulers, hmm. um, even if they're non-Muslim, as, as uh, I don't know if that's relevant at all. So we can, we can, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I don't know. No I worries. Give it um, think about the ayahs in the Quran, which which one can think about to exhibit coexistence that we don't want to combat the, or that like any, say for example, a non-Muslim person that we don't have to have an adversary relationship with them. Shaka, go ahead. That you can, uh, that you can uh, marry the, the Jew and the Christian. And what would you be trying to prove with that? Well, you know, if it's a bit, I guess, impractical if, on one hand, I guess some, if someone says you're supposed to kill non-Muslims outright, but then on the other hand, you're marrying them. It's like... They'll say that's the exception to the rule. It's <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm just so, like, you know, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, so, it's, what, it's you, you, so, you, so you have to kill all of them except the ones that you marry. Yeah, and don't tell ones you take as slaves as well. So I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. So uh, how would you respond to this? Okay, uh, now you go to the. These, yeah, these yeah, are the ones that everyone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is these are the ones, right? So this is chapter sixty, verse eight. Yeah. All right, uh, but this is the one that you are laying hakum on. Then what? This is the one, bring it because this is a good ayah, like for this mm. kind of uh, purpose. Chapter 60, verse 8. That Allah doesn't, how would you translate this? Uh, Allah has not forbidden you in relation to those who don't, uh, that those who don't fight you in your religion or kick you out of your homes uh, from being um, kind and cordial or unjust with them. Okay, who does Allah forbid you then? In the main hukum Allah. Those who do do those things, so those who uh, fight you in your religion, they kick you out of your homes. And they uh, like come together aiding and assisting each other in um, expelling you from your homes. That what you do, that what does it continue there? How does it go? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, right? Mm. That, that you cannot be allies with yeah, those. Yeah, you can't be allies with those Yeah, you can't be allies with those individuals, yeah. And whoever does so is? I think it's Lali Moon, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, or the, the, you know, transgressors or, yeah. or the evil, the, 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 the oppressors or the, the unjust ones. So, <coughs> Allah is telling us two things. Who we should have cordial relationships with and who we shouldn't. I was speaking to one guy before uh, who told me about his situation with uh, some takfiri groups some some like you know extremist groups or something like radical and he was saying that he was saying to them you know this hadith in Bukhari where the woman gets punished because she's torturing the cat and he said to him like what do you think of this hadith he said yeah that shows you it's haram to torture a cat he goes, what do you think of torturing the disbelievers? He said that, you know, it's different. So this guy, he was responding, apparently, like, this is a chain of... He was like, if Islam is a religion which doesn't even allow you to harm an animal, how could it be a religion which allows you to harm human beings and animals and children and these kinds of things? Uh, and this is, goes back to the hadith, which many of you should know. The first hadith they teach you in this kind of hadith studies and they say it's the hadith, uh, what do you call it? Ma'awal al-Musafaha or something, I can't remember what it's, it's like. Musalsal bil awwaliyya, not Musafaha, this is a different one. It's irhamu man fil ardi, irhamku man fil sama. Have mercy to those who are on the earth and the one who is in the heaven will have mercy on you. And men is al-fadl amum, it's one of the general terms. So the general uh, rule is actually to have mercy to people. And so, for example, Allah says in the Quran, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna And say good things to people. You know? And so, this idea that there's an initial adversariality, or there's an initial enmity, or there's an initial antagonism, or initial whatever, this is not really the spirit or the letter of the Islamic law. Because there's, Islamically, there's initial mercy. You know? There's initial safety and mercy, and, and then after that, whatever happens, happens through uh, instrumentality or exception. But it's not the initial state of, it's not what we want in, in, the, in the situation, best case in the situation. So if jihad happens, it happens as a result of either defending the territory or freeing up new land. That's basically it. What other examples would you give for Khan? Uh, chapter 489. Okay, and uh, do, you remember, do you know the contents of that? Uh, you want me to read it? Yeah, please. But do you not take for one of them? Kafaru, fat, fat, kuno, is that one? Yeah, but uh, there's there's a bit in the middle of it. Okay. إلا الذين يصلون و إلا الذين لا يصلون إلى قوم وبينكم وبينهم ميثاق أو جاءكم حصل صلوه. For ninety. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So 
from what I won't explain what's going Yeah, so if they immigrate and they become uh, uh except for the ones who are illa ladina asiluna, illa kaumin, wa bayna kum wa bayna hum mithaqun, aw ja ukum hasirat suduruhum. Yeah, except for those that have a pact with you. Um, Keep going. I think so. How is Spanish on and translated? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, pro no hablo español. <laughs> no problema. Post traumático. Maybe uh, Muaz. Yeah. What is the ayah? Uh, Four ninety-eight. Um, uh, it, 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 it first uh, talks about who we can fight, and then uh, it talks about the exception, and yeah. mentions that the exceptions are those who are allies allies of of a people. You are bound within a treaty of of those uh, wholeheartedly opposed to fighting, either you or their own people. Okay. And what is this? Aljaukum, the ones who came to you up. Sorry. It continues. Is a yeah, continuation. Yeah. If Allah had willed, He would have empowered them to fight you. So if they refrain from fighting you and offer you peace, then Allah doesn't permit you to harm them. Yeah. So it's very clear, isn't it? Yeah. This is not abrogates, from my understanding. You know. So these are good uh, ayahs to just bring. Because this idea of an impossible coexistence is, is defied by these kinds of hadiths and ayahs. Okay. So we need to make sure that we... Uh, we bring that. I think another line of argumentation is to, to show how many people have been killed by each civilization. Now, there is a book which I have here. Uh, I'm just going to stand up and get it, actually. I mentioned this, I think, before, and, but I want you guys to... This is an interesting way of making the argument, and I know we've covered this before, but repetition sometimes is important. Uh, this is a book of War and Peace in Islam, yeah? And th this guy, Naz Nazir Sheikh, he he has these uh, findings, which um, he 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 goes through like definitions, what he defines as world civilization. So he puts all these different civilizations. He does you know, and this is what he's got here. This is the ranking that he's got. Number one, he's got the anti-theists, the Buddhists, the Christian, the Indic, and the Islamic. Yeah, and he, what he's showing is that. A minimum death toll, maximum death toll, and median death toll. For example, the anti-theists, they've got the highest. If, the, if they're considered a civilization, he puts it at 95 million minimum to 152 maximum. Right? He's got his own methodology. You can read it in your own time, but I'm just giving you an example. Then you've got the Buddhists. Now, people don't associate war and death with Buddhism for some reason. Even though we have what we have with the Burma, uh, what's going on in Burma and the Rohingyas in, recent, in, in contemporary times. For some reason, Buddhism is seen as the religion of the true religion of peace or something, even though the death tolls and, and the wars uh, indicate to us that that's not the case. And here, Christian, or Christian civilization, or at least in practice, uh, there, there has been war or from them. Christian civilization is in third place, 119 million to 236 million. This is the range. Then you have the Indic, you know. And then you have the Islamic. So even if you look at it from a perspective of uh, death toll and numbers, I mean, just take a look at the 20th century. It's, it's by far, all you have to remember is the 20th century is by far the most, uh, many people that have been killed in any wars that have ever taken place. The 20th century, World War I or World War II. You have to remember that. It's not, these are not Islamic. If you just remember this fact, it's... it's almost insulting that people who come from civilizations like these speak to us as if they have the keys and we have you know that they can give us a lesson about this kind of thing obviously you saw me speak about this with Jordan Peterson 
and as you can see, like he had to admit, uh, you know, his uh, positioning and so on. It's not, it's, it's, it's undisputable. You can't actually dispute these evidences and these points. So just remember that. How else would you argue your point? Let's see, let's open up to the floor. Mehdi, how would you, so what else now? Let's imagine I am, I'm going to play those advocate for a little bit, uh, you know, an atheist saying, look, your religion is a religion of hate and uh, it does not encourage coexistence. It's a religion uh, of bloodshed and uh, uh, you guys need to modernize. I think like the pursuit of gain the eye from the Quran. Yeah. Now, how would you, now I'm putting this to you, how would you respond to this? Uh, now let him finish first. Let me. Let, we'll come to you in a second. Yeah. This is the end Just make sure you got uh, four ninety memorized. Yeah. Man قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد ثور كلمة قتل الناس جميعا. Beautiful. Okay. So this so is chapter five, verse thirty-four. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're saying, like Islam, how would you translate this first? Uh, whoever kills someone, man قتل نفسا بغير without يعني the the right. Uh, like well, they don't have the authority to do so. So they haven't killed the yeah. that person and killed somebody. Yeah. yeah. So like a non-combatant. Yeah. Uh, very often, uh, oh, in fil ard. Well, if they're cor causing corruption in the land, then it's as if they've killed. It's as if they've killed the entirety of mankind. So, hmm. uh, I think it's just like an evidence to show that Islam isn't what they're saying. Okay. Beautiful. Um, now, what would you say, Furqan? Tell me. So, so I'm coming with the same interrogation. How would you respond to it? I would say. <coughs> so you say you said that we Muslims uh, are here to kill everybody. That's what our religion teaches us. Mm -hmm. So I would say if that's the case, then we're doing a very poor job of being Muslims. <laughs> and uh, not only not only in recent years, but throughout history, like we've been uh, then we've been very soft with uh, the rest of uh, rest of uh, humanity. Yeah, and so we fine, but you don't, currently you we're talking about you don't deny the fact that the re your religion was there to initially uh, instruct you to kill the people then. Initially? Initially, so no, so there was that at least at one point. And what happened after? I don't know, you tell me, I mean, so you don't deny this, yeah? Uh, yeah, I deny it, but uh, my point How is that... How do you deny it? Well, my point is... implausible deniability. So you, you're basically saying that we f we used to be Muslims and then we stopped being Muslims. Is that what you're saying? No, I have said oh, nothing. Oh, Islam changed or something like that. I'm saying you. I'm saying that you know your religion instructs people to kill uh, innocent uh, bystanders. But what? So let me understand this. Yeah. So my religion instructed me to kill, and then it stopped uh, instructing me to kill people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying that's why my claim. I, is I don't. Yeah. I don't believe that. I think it was my religion was quite. Uh, uh, Consistent mm -hmm. on the on the in the, What's the evidence teachings. Of that? The Quran is, is the yeah, where in the Quran? The whole Quran. Okay, well you have to be more specific. Okay, so next time be more specific. Okay. Now it's your turn, Mahdi. Uh, Maad, sorry. <laughs> Come mm. to you in a second, Mahdi. Don't worry. Maad, uh, now it's your turn. So I say, look, you have a hadith that says, "Laqad uh, jittukum I've come to you with slaughter. And you have another hadith that says that, you know, Umrtu an uqatil al nas. I've been commanded to kill the people until they say Ashhadu Allah illa wa shahadu Rasulullah. Doesn't this indicate that your religion is uh, clearly intolerant and is trying to kill people that are non combatants? Yeah, I would say uh, if you take individual pieces of uh, evidence like this, uh, out of context, especially, uh, we could uh, construct any narrative that we want to. So the the wise thing to do, or the academic thing to do, would be to take uh, uh, the evidence as a whole, uh, which uh, our scholars have done, and see what the religion uh, and, and what and see what the religion says when you take a holistic. So uh, what, what did your prophet mean by "I've been commanded to kill the people until I said Ashhadu Allah"? Until this is Allah, 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 Allah. No, no, no. He's not going to help you. Uh, I forgot the context of it. So you forgot? Okay. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. But but there's unanimous consensus uh, that uh, we don't uh, we're not allowed to kill innocent civilians, uh, regardless of. So uh, your consensus goes overrides the hadith, the clear hadith. Uh, no, no th th that must be in a different context then. 
Uh, so what is that context? I'm not sure, but but okay. but, uh, but I'm pretty sure the scholars who came to the consensus knew it. <laughs> so Mahdi, what do you think the concern? What, what do you think the? You have to take the hadith in the context of the Quran. So the ayah that I mentioned. So if you have the hadith and the ayah, the ayah has a higher weight of like epistemic weight than the hadith. So here the Prophet so didn't mean just to kill. No, no, reject the hadith. We accept the hadith. Okay, also accept the ayah. We accept both. So how do you square We're the circle? We're saying this is one is specific. I have the hadith of Rasulullah and yeah. the other one is general. That's it. Which one's general? The ayah. But he says, Umar to an uqatil an nas. I've been commanded yeah, that to mean an nas. That doesn't mean everyone. Does it mean? Oh, I mean, it's from al-fadl al-umum. It's alif and lam. It's tarifiya. It's. Uh, let's pretend this. Uh, this Balaam, believer Balaam. is very clever. Allah alam. And we take it in context of the ayah and uh-huh. the hadith will never contradict what the ayah. Well, here you got a general so hadith and a general ayah, and they seem to be contradicting. It's not a general hadith. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, so as alif lam, but uh, well, alif lam. So what should, we do, what should we do with it, Shakir? How do we how do we deal with this? The hadith, umur uh, al-qatil mm. al-nas, uh, al-nas, like you're saying that it means every single human being. I'm saying yes. Uh, including is that including let's Muslims? Assume. Yeah. How huh? is that including Muslims? I see. That's that's good. Now uh, there you have it. Right. That's. You know who argued on this basis? I heard it from Abu Ishaq al Hawaini. He actually was doing sharh of this hadith. Yeah, he's yeah. a scholar of hadith in Egypt, and he says if we took the hadith to be am in a very clear way, he goes, I have been commanded to kill the people that would include Muslims as well. So it couldn't be accepted like this. And that's what he was saying, and he said that. So therefore, it's a general, is but it's ulida bihi khas. Which is like, you know, and what what is that mean? So, especially with an nas, like you can have, um, but generally speaking, anyways, if you have general terms, they c- you can use a general term in Arabic, but intend by it something specific. Give me and an example that's, of Quran. that's indicated by it. So, even with the word an nas, for example, mm-hmm. they say in Surah Nisa, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. some of them say that that refers to the Prophet. There's another ayah, which I'm so thinking what, what the one the in Imran well. with an nas, yeah, in Imran. Go on. It's sort of, uh, I, 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 can, I can see it on the page. What's there's an ayah in sort of There's an ayah here. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمَنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ Not this one. Oh, Could you use that? No. Uh, when that the people have come yeah, against yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, this, this is the one, yeah. Yeah, uh, so what is the ayah? Yeah, لِذَا قَالَ لَهُمْ النَّاسُ وَإِنَّ النَّاسُ قَدْ جَمْعُوا لَكُمْ Okay, so here the nas, what, 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 what are you saying? To? Uh, that if I remember correctly, I think it was referring to was it two people from? Hmm? So, uh, so it's the Confederates that are coming. It's not one. It's not all the people. It's yeah, just yeah. a group of people. Yeah. So it's uh, this is an example of specific group of people. Yeah. So it's it's an example of general wording mm. intended specific. for specific meaning. But I put that out there because it was a difficult one. <laughs> I want to see how you guys were going to deal with it. Yeah. But Sorry. Even if that's the case, that it's not from Muslims. The Prophet didn't kill everybody, every non-Muslim out good there. Good point. Uh, excellent. So yeah, good point. He didn't practice his own. Yeah, brilliant. That's a good. That's a good piece of evidence. So it couldn't mean that, could it? Mm. What if I say now, uh, for Khan, you know, this is a very uh, common interrogation, chapter nine twenty nine. Qatilu ladi la billahi wa la bil yom al akhir. You know that fight. The ones who do not believe in Allah in the last day, from the people who have been given the kitab, uh, from the people who have been given the, the old, you know, the, the people of the book, you know, uh, until they give the jizya in a subordinate fashion, and they are subservient or how uh, it's clear here, isn't it? That is saying you have to keep fighting, fighting the Christians and Jews until they give jizya. So it's compelling them to give jizya. This shows you clearly that it's about uh, forcing people to become Muslim. What would you say to something like that? Isn't it jizya for for non so for Christians Jews uh, living in a Muslim land? Yes. So I'm guessing if that's a, that's compulsory uh, part of the Muslim country. So if you want to live in this country, you need to pay this. In uh, tax or jizya, okay, and someone refuses to do so. Um, I guess there is consequences for that. 
Yes, but why do you have to fight them to get them to pay that? So what do you do then? Or do you expel them then? <laughs> yeah, I think you're onto something. But you can refine this <laughs> because you're a bit too non-apologetic here. I think you need to give them some level of just. <laughs> okay, uh, this I think no, that I'm, I'm, asking, yeah. I'm asking you like if they <laughs> if they don't uh, if they don't pay, then uh, I mean this, this, this there needs to be a way. Yeah, no, but it's, it's saying you have to fight them first, then get them to pay after. So what's going on here? It says until they fit, until they give the jizya. So clearly they haven't they're not given the jizya now. So, so they, they have I'm to fight I'm them until they do it. So I'm guessing that context is when the Muslims were still fighting with the with the with the non-believers who Christians. Are you guessing? You I'm, I'm meant to be the one asking you. So who's are you, do you know this or do you not know this? Uh, you asking a lay person for. So <laughs> 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 Okay, okay. No, but you're on the right tracks. I mean, especially with this thing of uh, jizya being like compulsory taxes. Jizya is not, well, I don't see, I actually don't, I actually don't see the controversy in jizya at all. I fail to see the controversy in it. They call it a sec, I remember in, in, um, in university when the one person was saying you have a discriminatory tax called the jizya. I said, what is discriminatory about it exactly? What's the problem with it? What's your issue with the jizya? So it's why is it that the Muslims get to pay zakat and zakat is more, actually, you pay more. In some cases, Muslims have to pay much more than the. I was reading Ibn Hajj, this is half a dinar or a dinar or something. The, the amount of money is not, if you have zakat al-mal and zakat this one and the zara and this and the plantations and you might be paying a lot more zakat than anyone would be paying jizya. So it's not even about more, it's not more money necessarily. It's, that's not what it's about. So what is the issue here? So that's, that's, I like that line of argumentation. It's just a name, name difference. Zakah is like, has purification connotations. They're also exempted from a lot of things. They don't have to fight, do they? No, There's no. a war, the, uh, the people who pray jizya, they don't have to fight. Is that right? Yeah, they don't have to fight, yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. it's, it's Subhanallah, you know? It's just don't betray the Muslim community and stuff like that. But uh, as as we've said, it's it's not really that problematic. I, I like that part of it. It's like hearing this making that. But this, how would you uh, assess the first part, nine twenty nine, uh, Mahdi? As in, we're not going out to enforce this on people. This is just like if we have a battle between each other, right? Who's having a battle with who? Like if they're coming and they're attacking us, and we're defending ourselves. So if there's a war, if it's a time of war. It's not like we're going out in this context, right? Okay, so how do we know this is not talking about civilians? Uh, how? Okay, go tell me more about that. So it's just like, any, like, how do you express it? Any, it's just with another person. So it's reciprocal. Yeah, reciprocal. That's it. Yeah. And how do we know it's reciprocal? Because it's uh, with the alif on the beautiful. The so, uh, yeah. So fa'ala. It's like the musharaka. So it's like for both of them are doing yeah. the same thing. So this is fight, not kill. It's not. It's not fight, kill them. It's fight. Yeah. Yeah. So it must be fight. You cannot fight people that are not fighting you back. Mm. So it must be combatants. So even in the term qatilu, there is an implied uh, imputation, which is that actually this is uh, already a reciprocal battle going on. Yeah. Okay. Well, these are some of the things. I'm going to bring two more uh, things just to uh, come back to Furqan. But be sure with this one that you don't say anything ridiculous because uh, it's a very controversial topic. <laughs> uh, what if I say, well, if, you, if your Prophet ﷺ was so peaceful and so merciful, then what about the Jewish tribes of Banu Quraidah? That uh, he, he oversaw the slaughter of 600 Jewish people in the tribe uh, and he, in fact, encouraged or legitimized it or mandated it. If this was a man of mercy, then how could he do such a thing? So first of all, I would say uh, there, there, there was a treaty between the two. Yeah. Who? Uh, who's two? Two. Between the Muslims and the Jews. Okay. The Jewish tribes. Yeah. The Jewish tribes. Yeah. To protect uh, the Muslims in case of uh, uh, outsiders. Yeah. In this case, Americans attacking. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jews not only break the treaty, treaty, but they Aligned with the Meccans. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to the punishment, 
it was not the prophet deciding the punishment it was actually uh, mm. someone natural that decided that does that anyone remember who it was yeah it's sad yeah decided that that was supposed to be the pun that was the f uh, fair punishment Excellent. so and who was being punished uh, only the men and the Jews. So those who are those capable of what? Fighting. fighting, yeah. Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent answer. Well done. That was really good. Uh, so these are the, what I'm giving you here is the interrogations you're most likely to face. After you've answered them, remember the framework is the APECA framework. Who remembers the APECA framework? Assumption. Yeah. A stands for assumption. P stands for point. E stands for example. C stands for counter counterattack or counterexample. And an A is an analysis. So always have that as a blueprint to any shubuhat that you're given. The APECA framework, A-P-E-C-A. -E you start with the assumption, then the point, then the example, then the counterexample, and then the analysis. Because if you don't offer a counter, you're taking a punch without giving one back. So you, whenever you've, it's, you, know, you have to defend yourself, then you have to attack. And with that, guys, we will conclude. Uh, hopefully, uh, this is more entrenched into your minds. This is something we've covered before, but repetition on key issues is actually an important part of any spiral curriculum. It's an important part of any kind of learning. And so next week, we're going to be talking about the age of Aisha, and we've got some more information which we haven't covered in previous sessions, uh, which we're going to talk about. The age of Aisha and the marriage and the union of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is one of the key shubuhat. Um, and so one which we, it's a classic shubha, basically. It's one of the classic shubhat. So everyone here needs to be completely like strong with that one. And it will be more like this session where we're going to be doing a lot more interactive stuff. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed that as much as I have here. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.